Welcome back, everyone. 
As Reformed Jews, we should be most proud of our movement and its institutions. Since its birth in 19th century Germany, Reformed Judaism has evolved into the largest Jewish denomination in the United States, with almost 900 congregations in North America. But our commitment extends well beyond religious life on this continent. We are particularly proud of the work we do in Israel, and especially of our Israel Religious Action Center which labors tirelessly to maintain the vitality of Israeli democracy, to ensure an inclusive Judaism in our spiritual homeland, and to honor our commitment to Judaism as a religion of action as well as belief. On this holy day, we are privileged to receive a message and a charge from the extraordinary figure tasked with guiding the Israel Religious Action Center. Its executive director, Anat Hoffman, has dedicated her life to tikkun olam, repairing the world, from her days as a member of the Jerusalem City Council, her work with the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, and her leadership of Women of the Wall. Temple Emmanuel has been and remains a proud supporter of Anat's efforts, both philanthropically and programmatically. She is a living reminder of how, as we reach inward toward bettering ourselves in the year ahead, we must also reach outward toward healing the world around us. This address was out of necessity pre-recorded, but Anat was able to answer questions submitted by a few of our members. I am delighted now to welcome Temple Emmanuel's inspiring friend and partner, Anat Hoffman. Thank you, Rabbi Davidson. I love Rabbi Davidson, your Rabbi Davidson, for a hundred good reasons, but one of them I want to share with you. He's a mensch. He actually showed up in, in a hospital to visit my friend Judy. He didn't know Judy. Judy doesn't belong to a synagogue. He came to visit because she needed some spiritual sustenance and had no rabbi to turn to. And he was the turn to rabbi. He left his busy work and he showed up at a hospital bed as a person that he doesn't know. Both Judy and I will never forget so thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I'd like to share with you a text um, that uh, actually personifies the work of the Israel Religious Action Center. The Israel Religious Action Center is the legal and political arm of the reform movement. And the text I want to share with you is seven words long. First in Hebrew. Ani betzedek echeze panecha. In English, it's longer. As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I will be satisfied. It's from Psalms. And uh, I think we see the divine here in Israel when we do the right thing, when we do righteousness. And as for the part about being awake, I'm intrigued with the idea of woke. It's a new American verb that talks about how we need to challenge ourselves politically and uh, look again at things that we're used to and see if we can see reality in a new lens. I'm so eager to hear your questions and answer them. I'm just sorry I'm not there at Temple Emmanuel in Fifth Avenue. Uh, I love your synagogue. What a congregation. What a great uh, team of uh, clergy. And I'm sorry I'm going to see you from Jerusalem, not from New York. Well, how did I start with civil rights? It actually started with something that pissed me off. Uh, I, after finishing my studies in America, I arrived back in Israel. And I got my first uh, telephone bill from the Israeli telephone company, Bezik. Turned out to be a monopoly, the only telephone company in Israel. And they asked me for an exorbitant amount, something like 8,000 shekel, and I immediately asked them for an itemized bill. You see, I realized there is an itemized bill because I spent time in America. And they said, I kid you not, that we had five wars in the Holocaust, we're nation building, and we're, we don't do itemized bills. <laughs> and they also said that if they had to make an itemized bill for me, it will cost more than the bill. 
And then they made a big mistake. They cut off my phone. Um, that pissed me off. I started the Bezik Afflicted Clients Association. 5,000 Israelis demanding an itemized bill. It took nine months of phenomenal work. We, I was an athlete in my background, so uh, we went and did a phone hurling competition. We showed how far we could throw the phone. We did a Shana Tova, a New Year's greeting that showed a phone dipped in honey that sticks to your ear. We sued the Bezik company 46 times and won 43 of the 46. Every judge had a phone. We were in every media outlet because every journalist had a phone. Everyone had it against Bezik. And after nine months, the, the general manager of Bezik resigned. The new guy, Tzachal, calls me at midnight and says, I am appointing you now as the High Court of Appeals of Bezik. On the spot, I decided to excuse all my 5,000 fighters from paying their bills. Bezik still made money. And a year and a half later, all Israelis received their first itemized bill, and I realized I have a calling. When I get really pissed off with something, I can get some friends to join me and then just be creative and, and spontaneous and find a way to change the system. What a wonderful career. Well, being arrested is... Uh, in retrospect, it has its comic aspects. The comic part was when I tried to explain to a woman who was uh, charged with um, uh, prostitution, why am I in the cell with her uh, wearing, wearing my talit? Here is the women of the wall talit. Always a chance to show it off. And uh, I was explaining to this uh, woman who spoke no Hebrew and I speak no Russian, what, what am I doing there? And I said to her, uh, I was praying in a place you're not allowed to, and that's why I'm here with you. And she said, she asked me, are you, are you Pussy Riot? It's a um, group in Russia that uh, challenges. The, I said, yeah, I'm something like that. Uh, but basically, I lost my good mood within an hour after getting arrested. Uh, it's the physical, you know, they, they, you have to take all your clothes off. Uh, they do a physical search. Um, they ask you, are you suicidal? Uh, in my case, I didn't get a bed. The other person in the, in the cell was a car thief. She specializes in German cars. I asked her, what did you steal tonight? She told me, a Volvo. Here in the safety of Temple Emanuel, I can point out that Volvo is not a German car. <laughs> Maybe that's why she got caught. But basically, it, I do, I'm not missing the point that I am a Jew, a Sabra, uh, and I am in an Israeli jail, not once, but quite a few times, and I have a criminal record. Breaking the regulation that is uh, phrased as one cannot perform a religious act contrary to local custom, which offends the feelings of others. Let's look at this regulation for a minute. One cannot perform a religious act Contrary to local custom, who the hell decides what's local custom? Who's in charge? The rabbi of the wall? Why would a representative of a minority zealot group in Judaism dictate to all of us what we do at the wall? Why is he in charge of local custom? And besides, the wall has been in Israel's hands 52 years. Women of the wall have been there 32 years. I'm local custom by now, no? When do I become local custom? And uh, what does it mean any performing a religious act contrary to local custom which offends the feelings of others? Uh, who decides what's offensive? <laughs> uh, how, if my prayer is offensive to him, I guess there's some things that happen there that are, should be offensive to me. I must tell you, nothing in the men's, men's section I find offensive. May a thousand flowers bloom. I like everything that happens there. I just want to have my right to express my religion in the way I want. And women of the wall have been there 32 years. A group that is multi-denominational, orthodox, reform, conservative together, 
praying out loud, reading uh, together from the Torah when we are able to get hold of one, uh, wearing our talitot, blessing the lulav, and lighting the menorah, we have made tremendous achievements. If it weren't for Women of the Wall, I believe the women's section would have been one fraction of what it is today. Uh, let me just set straight what is the problem now. We are allowed to read from the Torah, but we're not allowed to bring the object from which to read. <laughs> you get that? We're allowed to read from Torah, but there are 200 Torah scrolls for public use over there at the wall, and we're not allowed to avail ourselves of them. And we're not allowed to bring one from home. We actually go through a body search at the entrance to the wall. They're checking that we're not sneaking in a Torah. That's ridiculous. How could this be in the Jewish state that we are searched for a Torah? Uh, the next time I'm arrested for sneaking in a Torah to the wall, I couldn't have a more proud moment. If you read about it, you should know. I'm grinning there from ear to ear. I can't think of a better reason to be arrested than to bring a Torah scroll to, for a 12-year-old girl who wants to read from it on her bat mitzvah. I encourage you all to come to Israel when we are all able to come to Israel and uh, join me in a bat mitzvah for a girl at the wall, at the women's section. Bring your Torah from home. Let's, let's make a difference here. Thank you, Linda. It's a, it's a wonderful question, and uh, do I have fears on that? Yes, I do, and I think you should too. I think there's a backlash on feminism also in, in the United States. Um, but I want to tell you what my sources of, uh, of hope. And one of them is the, this woman called Edna Shemish. She is common-law wife with a man she's been living with for many decades. And they both went to try to buy a double plot in an Israeli cemetery so they could be buried together. And they were denied because, because they were not married officially. And the plot that they liked is right next to an, an, another man. It is illegal in that cemetery. It's been their custom for 80 years that a woman cannot be laying between two men that she's not married to. You understand this? This means gender segregation is going underground and after death. We're, of course, suing the cemetery. But you should know that there are a little bit over 300 cemeteries in Israel, and the great majority, 300, are Orthodox cemeteries, meaning that the burial is completely done in an Orthodox manner. And one of the things we'd like is freedom of choice in burial, as we would like freedom of choice in marriage and divorce. We would like Israelis to have alternatives. We actually have this message, which you think is so trivial, obvious, that there's more than one way to be Jewish. <laughs> I know that in Temple Emmanuel that makes so much sense, but here in Israel it's actually so subversive. More than one way to be Jewish? Now that's shocking. Another uh, face that comes to mind with your question, Linda, is that of Rosie Davidian. She is a woman from a moshav. It's like a kibbutz, but it's not, in a place called Patish. Trust me, I'm an Israeli and I've never heard of Patish. It's somewhere in the south. <laughs> anyway, she's one of eight brothers and sisters. Her father died of a brain tumor after two years' struggle. There was time for the family to prepare, and she wrote a eulogy. She's the poet in the family. She wrote a very moving eulogy for her dad. When they arrived in the cemetery, there was a partition in the cemetery. Men on one side, women on the other. The brothers on one side, the sisters on the other. When it was time to eulogize her dad, she asked for the microphone to be moved to the women's side. The rabbi refused. He said, get your brother to read your eulogy. He said, I can't read her handwriting, and besides, it's Rosie's eulogy. She wasn't allowed to read the eulogy then. We brought her to Jerusalem. We had her come to the Knesset, to the parliament. She read 
uh, the eulogy and spoke about her uh, experience at the Knesset Commission. She, there wasn't a dry eye in the parliament when she spoke. We later took her to a radio station, first time in front of a microphone. And Rino Tso, who has about a million and a half listeners, said, uh, Rosie, why don't you just read your eulogy? And a million and a half Israelis heard that eulogy. And it changed the rules about cemeteries. It is no longer, longer legal in Israel to have partitions in cemeteries. And just to make it sweeter, we sued the bastards in the court. She won the highest amount in small claims court in Israel. She's my woman of the year. First time in Jerusalem, first time in front of a microphone, and first time in court. And she changed this uh, scourge. But as you know, there is a... There was until recently, and there are still cases of segregation on buses, and of course, the segregation on airlines. Uh, we had a case against El Al, a, the national carrier of Israel, where a woman was asked in a business class from Newark to Tel Aviv to move her from her seat because an ultra-Orthodox guy refused to have her sit next to him. Rene Rabinovich was 81 at the time. She went to court. We sued El Al. She won the highest award she can, and El Al changed their policy. It is no longer legal in El Al for a stewardess to, or a flight attendant to ask you to move. If you're on a plane and a stewardess does ask you to move, it is worth around $20,000. All you need to do is just make sure the stewardess is the one asking you to move and not one of the uh, general public because then we can't really help you. Uh, recently, 10 days ago, we got a new call from Melanie Wolfson who's suing EasyJet. She was flying to London. She was uh, uh, asked to move from her seat. Uh, she did move because the, steward, the flight attendant asked her, and I think uh, Melanie is also going to be receiving $20,000 in uh, compensation because it is illegal. Just imagine if someone said, I can't sit next to you because you're black. <laughs> I can't sit next to you because you're Jewish. This is intolerable. Why are we willing to accept it? I'm not willing to sit next to you because you're a woman. You know, being a woman is one of these things that at least until recently we couldn't really change. But that's another, another story. So am I afraid that, is, that we're moving backwards? Uh, in some ways we are. You know, the two strong influences on Israeli society are the military and the rabbanut, both pa patriarchies and both have very few women in their leadership. And uh, almost 40, 40 members of our Knesset, our parliament is 120 members, almost 40 of them are rabbis or generals. That is, they come from these two hierarchies. So these are the two strongest uh, influences of Israeli, in Israeli society. Uh, it's time we broaden the, uh, broaden the, broaden our repertoire or received there are other incubation of leadership in Israel, and I'd like to mention one, and that is the Israeli NGOs. The non-government organizations are run by women in Israel, and you can see now in the Knesset and in other places, leaders that were in the NGO world, in the civil world, and women are making headway there. So am I afraid? Yes. And do I see some progress? Yes. And I think that you in America for a good long time, I'd say the first 40 years of our state, you were fed for a good long time with images of a woman with an Uzi or a kibbutznik woman with a hoe on her shoulder. A lot of photographs that showed you that the new Israeli woman is so different from the Jewish woman of, of the diaspora. She is strong. She is tough. She... <laughs> she can operate a semi-automatic machine gun and, uh, what is it, 32 bullets a minute on the Uzi. She's a Rambo. I, I think you were fed a false image. I think all along there were many photographs of women holding an Uzi or holding a hoe, but very few women actually did, were in combat or did do non-stereotypic work. So I think you are just coming to terms with the reality. 
And the reality is that we have some tremendous leadership now in Israel. This Knesset, more than any other Knesset, has a higher proportion of women. We have a few women in the government. Well, this government is so large, there was even room for women. So there's room for fear, but also some room for hope. Okay, Eva, you hit it on the head. This is really a uh, brace yourself. We're going to hear some unpleasant things about the Jewish state. But first, let's say something loving about it. We're a young state. We're only 72 years old. And we are all scarred by Holocaust, whether we are feeling it um, rationally and awake to it every day. I believe that most Jewish Israelis have a Shoah moment, a Holocaust moment every day. You know, I was renting an apartment a while back and I was uh, noticed that next to the bathroom there was this little cubby hole and I lingered on it. I looked at it for one second and the realtor says, you're having a Shoah moment, aren't you? You're thinking Holocaust. I said, yes, how did you know? She said, everybody does. I was actually thinking unconsciously whether a kid would actually fit there when they come. So we are worried about this new state and we are worried about devastation and destruction and one should have some empathy to the fact that we do. Having said that, we have turned to some uh, irrational ways to protect the Jewish the Jewish character of Israel. We're worried that everything can pollute our Jewish character. We came up in Israel with the awful term Jewish blood. We actually check how much Jewish blood this person has in her or his veins. Jewish blood is a terrible term. The only people using it other than us were the Nuremberg Laws that decided who goes, to the, who goes to the concentration camps, how much Jewish blood this person has in his veins. The idea in the Bible and in our tradition, there is damnaki, which means a pure, innocent blood, and mei achecha, meaning the blood of your brothers. There is nothing like Jewish blood anywhere in our tradition. Uh, in the beginning of our state, we wanted to uh, we were confident enough to actually not notice it. I'm, I'm holding here the Hebrew Encyclopedia, 32 volumes. This was the height of Israel's creation when uh, intellectually in the first few years of, our, of the birth of our nation. And I wonder of the 32 volumes, take a guess, how many volumes are Judaism? This is the big encyclopedia. People, every home had it. It, everybody was raised with it at home. People thought this would posterity will be everywhere. How many volumes are Judaism? Look how smart they were. I'm opening page 162 of the Encyclo Hebrew Encyclopedia, and I'm reading Judaism, and it says, look up Am Yisrael. Look up the story of the people of Israel. They didn't dare to define Judaism at the Hebrew Encyclopedia. They felt that the story of Judaism is your story in New York, and their story in Buenos Aires, and another story in Gundar in Ethiopia, that the story of Judaism is the story of all of us coming together from all the world. So we've come a long way from then till now, where the Ministry of Interior has actually announced that so many asylum seekers in Israel are not refugees. Um, there are in Israel now 20 refugees. That is, of the 40,000 asylum seekers in Israel, only 20 were recognized as refugees. We can have them for dinner in my living room. So when Mr. Netanyahu says to American Jews, I will deport no refugee, MS, it's true. He won't deport 20 people. What about the other 40,000 asylum seekers from Eritrea, from Sudan, that are seeking refuge in Israel? 
and are willing to become part of us. What about Jews of color that are suffering from the estab religious establishment on every step of the way? The obsession with purity and the ethnocentrism that we feel in Israel is a scourge. And as I said, I think it's a scar. And I wish we could get rid of it. Well, thank you for this question that requires a bit of introspection. Uh, I'd say where I see the least movement. Israelis are very tolerant of the occupation of uh, the, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian population. This is the biggest elephant in the room. We are tolerated, tolerating this, living with this, and not finding a solution to the conflict, meaning two-state solution, Palestinian state alongside Israel. As far as civil rights is concerned, I think this is the biggest issue of civil rights that we're just habituated to it. We don't notice it. Israelis are quite comfortable with the fact that there are millions of people under military rule uh, right next to us. Where did we make advances? In consumer rights, we're big. In environmental rights, we're getting there. In disability rights, we're moving forward. In women's rights, in some areas, our laws are better than many others. The fact that they're not implemented is a different matter, but we do have some excellent laws uh, at our, at our uh, disposal. We're also weak on religious rights. Uh, the rights of Orthodox Jews in Israel, wow, they are taken care of. But the rights of people who are not Orthodox Jews, or not Jews at all. We have Circassian, Gypsies, Druzim, Bedouin, of course Christians, and Muslims of different uh, sects, and their lot is very different than Orthodox Jews. I would like to open the world of religion to good, healthy, kick-ass competition. May the best rabbi win. May the best uh, le religious leader win everywhere in Israel. Uh, the fact that only Orthodox rabbis are considered rabbis in Israel because the Hebrew Union College, you did hear of Hebrew Union College, and the Jewish Theological Seminary both are not recognized as Jew institutions of Jewish learning. Do you know the word chutzpah? That's chutzpah. So I think on religious pluralism, we're a bit weak. And on uh, equality, we're, we're working. And on tolerance, we, uh, we still have to, we have a lot of ways to go. Robert, move to the head of the class. <laughs> a, I always believed that Israel is way too important to be left to the Israelis. It's a joint project. Of course, the Israelis are very important, but we do need your help. This is the only Jewish state on the planet Earth. If we screw this one up, I don't think we're going to get another chance to start another state. This is it. And we're engaged in, in a wonderful dialogue. What, what kind of state do we want? And your stake in it is no bigger than mine. We're the same. I want to talk a minute about, do you have the right to interfere and impose your values on us, the Israelis. The taxi driver taking you from Ben Gurion Airport to Tel Aviv will tell you on the way, you, you don't tell me what to do. You don't pay taxes here. You don't send your children to the army here. What right do you have to tell me what to do? I want to inoculate you against this taxi driver's monologue. Yes, you don't pay taxes here. By the way, Israel's number one in tax evasion in the OECD, but let's put that aside. And true, you don't send your children to the army here. By the way, in the year 2019, 50% of Israelis sent their children to the army, and 50 didn't. Just so you know, only half of us send our children to the army. But forget these points. This is, the, the, this is the largest Jewish table. This is where we discuss what are the Jewish values of the Jewish state. Are you Jewish? 
You have a right to have a seat at the table. I want to hear what you have to say. Israel needs to hear what you have to say. You have a contribution to make. It's not a spectator sport. We don't sit on the sidelines and just watch what Israelis do. We need to engage. And for, or in order to engage, we need to learn about Israel. Broaden your, is, your diet about Israel. Read the newsletter. I write a newsletter every Monday. Raise your hand if you get it. It's, it's, it's short. <laughs> it's funny. And uh, I'd like you to read our newsletter and send it to your friends and respond to our newsletter. Every once in a while, I ask you to send a letter to the prime minister or write a letter to your local paper about the stuff we do. Below, you can see all the other things we'd like you to do. Now, why am I asking you to do it if it's not effective? It is very effective. We have a few examples where things changed here on the ground in Israel because you couldn't put up with them. Let me give you an example. The law of return that was passed in the 50s says that anyone making aliyah that immigrates to Israel has to be uh, someone who converted to Judaism or is born of a Jewish mother. Converted to Judaism. It doesn't say converted orthodox to Judaism. Every ultra-orthodox party in the history of Israel has listed changing the law of return in its platform. They want to say that the conversion would be kahalacha, according to orthodoxy. Why hasn't it changed? If all of them want to change it, why hasn't it changed? You know why? Because of you. Because if you jump out of your skin, you become maniacs. You come on missions to Israel. You go crazy. If someone would say that a reform and conservative conversion does not qualify to make aliyah to Israel. So there. Here's an achievement. I think you could do a lot more. I think you're awfully polite, maybe too polite. And I'd like you to get engaged. Please, follow Robert. <laughs> get involved, get engaged. Let's work together to mend the Jewish state. It's the only one we got. If there was another Jewish state, I'd be on the first plane going there. But right now we have only this one. Let's make this one as best as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Anat, for all you do and for all you are. And now we turn to our second topic. In April 1845, 33 German immigrants rented a loft on the Lower East Side to build the religious community that would one day be Congregation Emmanuel of the city of New York. Could they ever have imagined what their little synagogue would become over the ensuing 175 years. How large it would grow, the magnificent sanctuaries it would come to occupy, first on 43rd Street and then on 65th, the role it would play in shaping liberal Judaism in America. There's no way to know, of course, but it is fair to assume that if from their perch above Grand and Clinton, they could have seen what the future held for their creation, they would have been proud. Today, as we reflect on our individual spiritual journeys these past 12 months, we turn at this hour to consider our shared congregational journey these past 175 years. And we do so through the lens of the magnificent Archives and Judaica collection housed in our Herbert and Eileen Bernard Museum. And I am pleased that its gifted curator, Warren Klein, will serve as our teacher, historian, and guide. As this talk, too, was pre-recorded, Warren cannot answer questions live. That said, know that you can always reach him at the temple to learn more. Now, wishing you the hope of a good year, I am so grateful to introduce Warren Klein.
patience on this. Uh, we're going to start from the beginning. Um, so don't worry, you didn't miss anything. Um, so I really appreciate my colleagues help on this. So thank you for bearing with us. Uh, this is actually a live uh, presentation. Um, so I just want to again give my thanks to Rabbi Davidson for the lovely introduction and wish everyone a Shana Tova, a very happy and sweet new year and a good Yantif today. Uh, my name is Warren Klein. I'm the curator of the Herbert and Eileen Bernard Museum in Judaica, which I am in right now coming to you live. Um, and again, I think I'm just going to wait another minute or two while people trickle in. We were having a few technical difficulties um, and really appreciate everyone's patience um, on this. And uh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so I think as people begin to trickle in, I, I'm just going to kind of get started. Um, so it's always a pleasure for me to dive into our rich archival materials that we have here at the temple uh, and present it to you as I have been uh, during Yom Kippur during the study sessions. Um, but part of what I always look forward to is being able to bring original objects into the classroom, documents, photographs, uh, minute books, um, it really varies year to year. Uh, so this year, digital images uh, will have to do, uh, but I do look forward to gathering in person um, as um, the time permits. Um, so um, as Rabbi Davidson mentioned, um, this actually is, is going to be live. And so I do welcome people to uh, have Q&A as it comes up. You can type it into the chat function and I'm going to get to all the questions at the end. Um, so just feel free to write them as they arise and I'll circle back. So the subject for today's session, how we celebrated anniversaries at Temple Emmanuel, 1870 to present. As all of you know, this year, many festivities such as Shabbat dinners, galas, and even a museum exhibition uh, were scheduled to celebrate our 175th anniversary. But because of COVID-19, um, we were forced to postpone these events. As my colleagues and I started the planning process almost a year and a half ago, I started to wonder how the congregation celebrated such special anniversaries in the past. So I began to dig into the archives and look up brochures and photographs. And I started to see that some of the ideas that we were having for events and programs were not so much different than the way that they had ideas to celebrate these milestones 50, 75, even 100 years ago. I also discovered that at Temple Emmanuel, we love to celebrate anniversaries. It is important to celebrate how much we have accomplished, the hurdles we have overcome, and the hopes for a better tomorrow. By looking at the past, we can honor our future and take pride in the celebrations and achievements and make the next time we celebrate in person that much sweeter. So when thinking about the earliest anniversary that could have been celebrated, um, I thought, I make things a little bit easier on myself. Um, thinking that a possible five or 10 year anniversary um, might not have happened, it might have been unlikely, uh, because in the 1850s, you know, the congregation was really focused on survival and growth, and there was constant moving around of buildings. But I'll be real honest here. One of the reasons I decided not to start was because our earliest uh, archival records, our minute books from that time are all in German, as the congregation was a German speaking congregation. And instead of trying to sit there with a magnifying glass and translate each word one by one, I knew that I should start a little bit later. So I pulled the minute books, the Board of Trustees minutes uh, for the year 1870, which would have been our 25th anniversary. And I started, I started in January thinking that the preparations for an anniversary uh, would have started a couple of months prior. And so I looked in January and February and March, and it wasn't until March 8th, about one month before the 25th anniversary, did I find this little snapshot that's on the screen. Um, and now remember, by 1870, we were already two years into our new building at 43rd Street. Um, and I'll read you this little excerpt from the March 8th meeting. To hold a sacred concert in the temple in connection with the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the existence of our temple, which will take place on April 13th. So here's just a little highlight of where it mentions the 25th anniversary. 
And then the next meeting took place um, in early April, and it mentioned and that uh, the Reverend James Goodheim, who was the assistant rabbi at the time, would also read a history of the temple on the occasion. And I, I just can't help but laugh in thinking of all the planning that takes place in so many of our events and programs, months, sometimes years in advance, especially with exhibitions, um, that this was planned a month in advance, they were just gonna throw together this concert. And I was really excited to find this mention of an anniversary. Uh, I know that our archive is a little bit slim on material from that early on, from the 1870s. So I thought that I had hit the jackpot. I found a reference to the 25th anniversary. I'm going with it. I took a photo, a photograph of it, great. It wasn't until five days ago, last Wednesday, doing some last minute preparation. I'm looking through a couple of boxes to see if I can find anything else about anniversaries. And lo and behold, I found this brochure, a brochure from that 25th anniversary sacred concert on Wednesday, April 13th. And I just thought to myself, I mean, the timing of this was serendipitous, beshert, if you will. And I thought to myself, you know, this is an uncatalogued piece in our archives, and this is probably the only copy of this that still exists in the world. So I, I was so excited to find this. So the brochure in the inside, it lists the, the program, it lists the different musicians and the scores um, that the musicians played. And even to more of a surprise, um, I, I looked at it a little bit more closely and you can see that two women participated in this. Uh, we have a Miss Clara Pearl, who played a solo coronet to Rosini, and a Mrs. Pauschtick sang the 111th song. So this appeared to be a very fitting tribute for, for a 25th anniversary in 1870. Um, by 1895, at the time of the 50th anniversary of the congregation, uh, the congregation had grown substantially and was really a force among New York Jewry. Probably the greatest gift is this publication by Meyer Stern, and I have a copy with me right now, um, Meyer Stern was the secretary of the congregation, and he wrote this book um, in celebration or in honor of the 50th anniversary. Uh, and so the title is The Rise and Progress of Reform Judaism, Embracing a History Made from the Official Records of Temple Emanuel of New York with a Description of Salem Field Cemetery. Uh, and you'll notice the wonderful kind of um, embossed cover with the outside of the 43rd Street building. Uh, this is really a great resource for a lot of historians. Um, I, I see it constantly quoted in, in articles and digital versions can be found, um, I believe on the New York Public Library website, many university websites. And if you have the time, I, I really would recommend having a look. And of course, when the time is right, we would invite you back to our Stettenheim Library. We have copies in our collection as well. So Stern presents a summary of the con of congregational history uh, which includes mention of noted members, uh, clergy and their backgrounds, as well as the numerous philanthropic activities of the congregation. He really goes into depth, I mean, year by year. Um, and it's really wonderful to see, um, you know, one of those, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, the outreach that the congregation was doing um, as far as communities in Eastern Europe that they were helping, um, as, well, as well as helping communities here um, on the Lower East Side in their backyard. Um, so in preparation for the Jubilee anniversary, as he calls it, uh, he lists the different committees that were formed. And uh, I, I really love this a lot. Um, I'm going to read the list of committees. There was the Memorial Committee, the Invitation Committee, the Decoration Committee, the Press, Printing, and Police Committee, and the Music Committee. Uh, I often wonder why there needed to be a police committee uh, and why the printing and the invitations weren't the same one. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, that's maybe for a different talk. Um, so Stern lists a play-by-play -play account on the day of the celebratory service of the 50th anniversary uh, with a complete transcription of Rabbi Gottheil's sermon. So I just wanted to read a brief quote from that sermon. I find that we have maintained the same spirit and method of action, which the congregation adopted at the beginning. The freedom we claim from, for our community from the outside, we have ever accorded to those within the community. With mutual forbearance and the broadest toleration, we have endeavored to find our path through all differences of opinion. And so strong is our faith in these principles that we face the problems of the future with confidence 
that they will be solved without the least disturbance of the friendliness and goodwill that have hereto ruled our congregation. Um, so of special note, uh, these are two brochures uh, that I found celebrating the 50th anniversary. On the right is a brochure for the special Sabbath service that took place uh, on April 13th. And on the left is a different brochure from a different service um, that was just for religious school students that took place the following day on Sunday during school hours. And I thought this was very interesting because it really gave students the opportunity to participate in not only learning about the temple's history, but in writing poems and songs and readings. Um, and, and it really was a participatory service. And um, as I got further along in the anniversaries, I noticed that, that this would become a theme, the participation of all um, parts of the temple, um, uh, young and old. Um, so a special note um, on the Saturday celebration, the Sabbath celebration, was a jubilee hymn uh, that I put up on the screen that was written by Rabbi Gottheil for the occasion. And again, this is another theme that we're going to see is these special hymns and, and writings and readings uh, that were um, made in honor of the occasion. Um, and lastly, I'd like to point out the very bottom, the benediction was given uh, by Reverend F. DeSola Mendez, uh, and he was a rabbi um, at Shari Tefila. So you have um, the participation of another uh, New York rabbi from another great historic congregation. Uh, this is another theme that we're going to see. Um, invited clergy um, at this time, you know, locally, uh, but as we get into the 20th century, we get clergy from around the country participating, which is really wonderful. And probably one of the most exciting things that I found um, in honor of the 50th anniversary uh, was this scrapbook. Um, this is the cover of a scrapbook. It is a hand-painted watercolor on board. And what it is, is you're seeing a depiction of the 43rd Street building, very large in, 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 the, in the foreground. And at the very top is a depiction of Emanuel's first location in a rented space on the second floor of a building at the corner of Grand and Clinton Street. And, um, you know, we don't know who made this scrapbook and on the inside is, uh, you know, just little um, wonderful uh, piece together invitations and announcements and uh, program brochures. Um, but it really is just a wonderful slice um, of that time. And um, hopefully this coming year, we'll have it repaired. You can see it's not in the best of shape on the cover. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we're now in the 20th century in 1920, uh, and we are celebrating the 75th anniversary. Um, kind of a funny story that I'm going to admit about this photograph. First of all, it's the first photograph we have um, of a celebration, or rather this is the sanctuary decked out at 43rd Street um, in garlands and flowers uh, for the celebration. And this photograph was actually incorrectly labeled as a Shavuot service. I think that maybe someone had thought that all of the floral decor maybe um, resembled what the decorations would have been like for Shavuot. However, as I zoomed in on the Star of David, you can see there's um, uh, two years. It says 1845 to 1920. And, and sure enough, I figured, you know, this had to have been for the, for the celebration. I mean, we heard in the 50th anniversary, there was a decorations committee. So no doubt that the decorations here were, um, were a big to do as well. Um, I mentioned that we're gonna see uh, another hymn. Um, so on the right, we have a special anniversary hymn uh, that was written by uh, our Rabbi Enelo. Um, and the music to this one, the other one, we didn't know if there was music that was um, set to, was done by A.W. Binder. Um, who was later known as being the music director at Stephen Wise and composed many scores of liturgical music that we still use today. And on the left, uh, this is the official invitation or announcement um, of that special service that went out to the congregation by uh, President Louis Marshall and the secretary, uh, William Spiegelberg. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see uh, the exact schedule of program of the celebration, um, but one thing I also noticed uh, going through all the anniversaries, that as the years went on, the celebrations became uh, more elaborate and greater. Um, remember the 50th anniversary, we had one special service and then another service for the religious school. 
But here we actually have four services that are listed. We have a Friday evening, Saturday morning, Saturday evening, and then another Sunday morning for the religious school. Um, so invited clergy um, were, came from, from different congregations. Uh, Rabbi or Reverend uh, Joseph uh, Krauskopf from Congregation KI in Philadelphia gave a sermon on Friday evening. And then um, Reverend David Philipson from B'nai Israel in Cincinnati on Saturday. Uh, and of course, many esteemed board members from local congregations, president of the CCAR came. Um, and another interesting thing I learned was that at the evening service, a memorial uh, tablet was dedicated to members of the congregation who served in World War I. And again, a light bulb went off because um, those of you who enter our Fifth Avenue lobby will see two tablets, two large tablets. One is the name of those members of our congregation who served and died in both World War I and World War II. And of course, the one in World War II, I knew had to have been um, dedicated in our previous building, but it's so interesting to learn the exact date um, at which this happened. So um, again, next time we are all together and can worship together, I, I invite you to look for that in the Fifth Avenue lobby. Um, so moving right along, 1945, uh, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the congregation. I mean, Sorry to have this picture of the cake up today. Um, it is a little tempting. Um, so the 100th anniversary uh, celebration was kicked off with a gala dinner at the Waldorf Astoria, which uh, you see right here. Uh, in the photograph, just to name a few, we have former Governor Herbert Lehman, a member of our congregation, uh, Admiral Louis Strauss, president of the congregation, and Dr. Goldenson, among other guests. Um, we have a lot of great photographs from that evening. You can see the live band and the tables. It looks just like a really festive, wonderful gala. Um, the 100th anniversary in 1945 also marks our, our first correspondence with a president. Um, here we have a letter from President FDR to Dr. Goldenson. And when I think this is really remarkable, I've definitely seen this letter before, but it didn't register to me until this. The letter is dated February 28th of 45. Now, those of you who are, you know, just history buffs know that Roosevelt died in office in April of 45. So someone must have had the foresight to write to him early, early that year, um, you know, kind of mentioning that this, this wonderful celebration was happening, this milestone, and, and this is the letter that he wrote back in return. So it really is so special that we have this. And we have, you know, a few other letters um, moving forward. I'll share with you one more, but... I wanted to again share an excerpt from this letter that I found really moving. Uh, he writes, the gravity of the times which mark the 100th anniversary of the establishment of Congregation Emmanuel quickens the hearts and souls of thinking men and women, appreciation of their dependence on the strength that can be found in the everlasting reality of religion. And he goes on to conclude that um, it is well for us, therefore, in the face of global war and world upheaval, to emphasize the many essential things in which we, as a nation, can find unity as we seek solution of the momentous problem before us. And I just thought that was really powerful. And, and just reading that last line, too, just really, I mean, I know we're not in a war, but it just really resonates uh, with so many of the issues that we are facing today, uh, to seek a solution for the momentous problem before us. Um, and getting back to some more celebratory things, uh, again, we, the actual the celebration really kicked off a year prior in 1944 with a year's worth of, of lectures and events and concerts. Um, but actually, one of my favorite things to learn was that there was an exhibition. Um, again, we have no other record from this aside from one little mention. Uh, and I'm going to read a quote from one of the brochures. A centenary exhibition. Uh, which contains mementos and relics of the past 100 years is now on display in room 403 of the community house. Many photographs, letters, and documents related to the life of the congregation can be seen along with some splendid reproductions of former edifices of the congregation. Um, see, once again, no new ideas. Uh, they were even thinking of doing an exhibition 100 years ago, and actually this excerpt is from uh, the Temple Bulletin um, in early 1945. And um, I think in actually 1943 or 44, they were uh, they called out to members of the congregation 
to, uh, to lend things, uh, you know, again, people who might have been members or families who have been members for almost 100 years. Um, there's a wonderful scrapbook that someone put together of all of the speeches and letters and photographs and many press releases uh, went out to different local newspapers and national newspapers, in fact. But I was very touched by this one uh, newspaper article. This is from uh, Der Tag, which is a Yiddish daily newspaper here in New York, or was, I should say. And again, all of the, the newspaper clippings are all of English uh, newspapers from around the country, but I just thought it was so interesting uh, that, you know, again, probably not many of our members in 45 were Yiddish speakers. Um, however, um, that newspaper uh, saw it fitting uh, to do an article about um, Temple Emanuel's 100th anniversary. Um, I should also mention that there was a special service uh, for the armed forces that was led by our member, uh, Brigadier General Julius Ox and uh, different special concerts um, that Cantor Rudino um, uh, led with our temple choir. And there was also a choral festival that celebrated the music of Emmanuel of 100 years uh, that was right around Passover. Um, and so for the first time, um, we had a public fundraising campaign to go alongside with an anniversary. And, and this is what's up right now. This was called the uh, Centenary Fund and it was established to enable the congregation to finish paying off the mortgage on the 65th Street property. Um, and that time the mortgage was about $1.2 million, they write. And this appeal kicked off in November of 44 and concluded around the high holidays of 45. And uh, it mentions that about 680 individuals, estates and foundations participated whose names are listed in this volume. And they raised over $800,000 and I was kind of curious myself, so I did a little inflation calculation. Um, and depending on what you use, it's about $11 million in today's dollars. Um, so that didn't quite cover the paying off of the mortgage, but it did make a dent. Um, but the timing, um, again, I think someone could probably do a wonderful presentation about different uh, kind of serendipitous timings of events in our history. Um, the property that was located at Fifth Avenue and 76th Street now, this was the property that, that Temple Bethel occupied. Um, they could not sell that property until this year. And so the funds that they received from the sale of that building, which was later demolished, um, that was able to finish paying off the mortgage. So I found this all to be really interesting. And, you know, thinking about later anniversaries um, and building campaigns and restoration campaigns, um, you know, it's a very important thing. And uh, this is really the first um, evidence that I found of it in our history. Uh, 120th anniversary was celebrated in 1965. Again, a wonderful looking cake, I'm sorry. Um, so this anniversary was ushered in by, by another gala dinner. Uh, in this photograph, we have Rabbis Mark and Perelman, uh, Temple President Alfred Backrack, David Sarnoff, and Herbert Bernard. And probably in one of the most creative ways that I've seen in our history to celebrate an anniversary, a play was commissioned. Um, the play was called A Legacy of Light. Uh, and I'm still searching for audio. I'm sure there was no video recording of it, um, but I was able to find um, slides that they used. Um, this is a uh, uh, copy of the script that I found in our archive. And um, there were still photographs that were seen. So this is the play that was written uh, by Mark Siegel and it was uh, subtitled A Dramatic Presentation uh, written to mark the 120th anniversary of the establishment of Temple Emanuel, New York City. And so what, what it was, was actors reading from the script and then different slides uh, from different parts of our history were then uh, projected onto a large screen. And so in these stills that I found, we have the different buildings. Um, on the left is 43rd Street, on the right, this was our building on East 12th Street, the facade of which, or the, the front of it still exists. And then the bottom is um, Kaufman Kohler, uh, rabbi of Temple Bethel. Um, the other thing that I found really exciting was that uh, there were women who um, participated in this um, as well. That there was parts that were written for them. And you can see on, I think, the top right slide, the two women standing together as well. So uh, stay tuned. Maybe we'll find the audio recording of this one day as well. But I thought this was a very creative way um, to celebrate an anniversary. 
Uh, so once again, I found another great presidential letter, this one from President uh, LBJ uh, in 1965. Uh, I'll just read a little excerpt. It has been said that there are two ways of spreading light, by being the candle or the mirror that reflects it. Temple Emmanuel has kept aflame the candle of Jewish faith, and its membership has reflected the highest traditions of your heritage. Um, I think this is a quote we still often kind of reflect back on today. Um, and again, it's just, I think it's incredible to see the recognition um, from you know, the highest office um, of, our, of our legacy. Um, so five years later, they decided to celebrate an, yet another anniversary. Again, they, they love celebrating anniversaries. Uh, 1970, the 125th anniversary, uh, and there was a proclamation uh, from the mayor of New York City, uh, Lindsay at the time, um, you know, just talking about Emmanuel's history. Uh, we still have that proclamation in our collection. It's a little faded though. Uh, so here we have uh, Deputy Mayor Robert Morgenthau, of blessed memory, um, and of course, uh, President Alvin Coleman and Herbert Bernard. Um, so the 125th anniversary, to me, really marked kind of a, a little bit of a turn. It, it was a bit more of a, uh, it was really marked by, by lectures and concerts, um, you know, really inviting great thinkers and educators and rabbis from around the country. It just kind of marked a little bit more of an intellectual vibe to me. Um, so this is on the right is a, um, a flyer of some of the lectures that were happening during that year um, and some of the names that came. And on the left, um, it's wonderful, again, thinking about how students in our religious school interacted and celebrated with our history. Um, the ARC yearbook, this is um, from the religious school in 1970, the whole issue was dedicated to Emmanuel's history, poems, artwork, drawings. Some of you might have even been in this yearbook. Um, as well, but I just thought it was just another great way um, that we have that kind of intergenerational um, interaction with our history. And the, the lecture series, When Yesterday Becomes Tomorrow, um, was then put into a, a book and uh, given to members of our congregation as well. Um, so 1995, our 150th anniversary. This is probably the anniversary that is um, in many of your uh, not so distant memories. Um, 25 years ago, um, we, you know, I found a couple of brochures for a gala, for a, um, a fundraising campaign, and probably one of the more interesting um, programs was the, um, the commissioning of a Torah scroll from Herbert and Eileen Bernard. And I found this photograph, um, had not been officially digitized yet, of scribe Neil Yerman uh, with students from the religious school. Um, I believe families could come up and, and everyone could write a letter. And it was, I think, also possibly a fundraising activity. Um, so I think that was really great. And, and, this, and this scroll sits in our ark um, in the sanctuary to this day. Um, and I think this is also really so fun. And I, I regret not being able to participate in this activity. Um, this, there was a, a historic pilgrimage that took place. Um, they, uh, members of the congregation were invited to go to each of the different locations um, of our buildings, of course, not few of them are not standing today, um, starting on uh, Grand and Clinton Street. And you can see these are just snapshots. They're not official photographs. Um, students from our religious school holding up posters about each location. Um, uh, on the top uh, is uh, Christie Street. You can see it was an empty lot at that time. Uh, no doubt, I'm sure it's a condo or a hotel today. Um, and then on the bottom is East 12th Street. Uh, you can see that edifice was still there today. Um, and probably better an explanation of all of the events um, and this historic walking tour, uh, this is an article in the New York Times from April of 1995 uh, with actual a map of, of Lower Manhattan showing the different stops in our different buildings as well. And then a uh, mention of uh, our Torah being commissioned. So I want to stop thinking about the anniversaries of the Congress and, you know, I also thought about how we celebrate other anniversaries of individuals, of events. And the first one that I could think of was um, in, in 1888, uh, president of the congregation, Louis May, um, celebrated his 25th year in office. So I guess this is before we had uh, term limits. Uh, and he actually went on to be president until 1897. Um, and at the Thanksgiving service in 1888, 
uh, the Board of Trustees presented him with this beautiful vase, which is actually behind me on display, um, with a depiction of the 43rd Street building and a wonderful dedication, thanking him for his 25 years of service. Um, and then on the right is a brochure of different testimonials that were written, um, sermons from some of the rabbis, remarks from um, the trustees. Um, and so that is also on display as well. Um, I also found uh, in our museum collection, this vase that was uh, commissioned and given to Rabbi Shulman on the 10th anniversary. Uh, I'll read the inscription. It's a little bit hard to see with the reflection. Um, Congregation Temple Bethel, again, he was a rabbi first at Bethel, to its rabbi, Reverend Dr. Samuel Shulman, as a token of affection and appreciation on the 10th anniversary of his faithful and efficient ministry, January uh, 1909. And I really should say about Bethel, I meant to say this a little bit earlier, um, of course, um, for those of you who know, Bethel uh, was the great congregation that we merged with in 1927. Um, you know, I, I, I intentionally, it really wasn't an intention not to include Bethel's anniversaries because no doubt I'm sure they celebrated them, but the material is not so as readily available as the Emmanuel material. Um, but again, you know, just thinking about their history was certainly included in many of these anniversaries in the 20th century. Um, found this wonderful photograph of those who were in the women's auxiliary um, might have seen this before. Uh, this was uh, from 1947 uh, in, in Wise Hall. It's celebrating the 25th anniversary of the WA. Um, it was a special tea that was held. And, you know, I just love so much about this photograph. I mean, every single lady is wearing a hat. And um, the, the decoration in the background, you see this very elaborate, I think it's a candelabra with, you know, 25 in the background. Um, you know, just really so special. And, um, you know, I think one of the earliest photographs we have um, of the ladies. Uh, 1972, uh, Rabbi Perelman celebrated his 40th anniversary of ordination. Um, and um, as it says on this luncheon invitation, uh, ministry um, of the congregation. Um, and I just love, again, the juxtaposition of his photograph from 1932 and then 40 years later. Um, And uh, in 1980, um, we celebrated not necessarily our congregation, but our building. Uh, 1980 marked the 50th anniversary of the dedication of our sanctuary and community house. Um, and so a special service was held. And I'd love to play a short video clip for you. Um, a couple of years ago, I had uh, digitized some of our audiovisual material. And, you know, kind of as we've been cataloging it and thinking about how to use it, um, I found this clip that I was able to edit. So I'm just going to play a, a three minute clip for you from this Jubilee service in 
We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is in truth a day of joy. And our hearts beat with the measure of gratitude as we stand in the presence of our God, the God of our people, both past and present. In their wisdom, the architects of Judaism long centuries ago declared that time is the principal dimension of holiness. And so it is that this sacred, magnificent sanctuary achieves its fundamental majesty as an expression of time on the continuum of our people's march through history. Just as King Solomon built a great temple for the Lord in ancient Israel, so the people of Emmanuel built a great temple for God in modern America. In the same way that that king and antiquity was driven by a grand vision, so the congregation of Emmanuel was inspired by an expansive dream. Louis Marshall. So um, thanks for bearing with me and watching that clip. Um, so the, uh, I believe it was broadcast on a local television station here in New York. And um, the procession, I, I mean, I just love seeing the procession of the scrolls with the silver and our clergy. And I just wanted to give just a little taste uh, of Dr. Sobel's uh, sermon from that evening. Um, so hopefully we can um, clean this up a little bit and, and make it more available um, on another platform to see the entire service. It's about an hour. Um, so continuing uh, with some anniversaries, uh, again, some might be more in recent memory. Um, we celebrated the Bernard Museum's 20th anniversary. Um, although you know that our collection dates back even further, um, the, with the generosity of Herbert and Eileen Bernard, we were able to establish this wonderful museum. And we did a um, exhibition in 2017, um, looking back, moving forward. And we were able to bring back from, I think, all but one exhibition, at least one loan item or items from our own collection. Um, and it was, it was really exciting, um, you know, looking back on the exhibitions that I've been here for and the exhibitions that my predecessors, um, Elka and Riva had done. It was really just so wonderful to celebrate and also all of the wonderful uh, volunteers and docents from over the years. Uh, and of course, I reached out to my colleagues in the Department of Lifelong Learning, who in the same year celebrated uh, the 10 year anniversary of the formation of the Lifelong Learning Department. Um, it's a wonderful photograph of them, and the little graphic that was made as well, and there was a great service um, honoring um, the religious school um, and, and my colleagues as well. It was a really special night. Um, and, and, you know, many of my other colleagues here too have also, we've uh, celebrated their work anniversaries, uh, 25, 30, even 50 years, um, really an inspiration um, um, to me personally. And I wanted to end on, on a happy note and actually an anniversary that we'll be celebrating this week. Um, the 75th anniversary of the Sunset Service. Um, all are welcome um, at 5.30 p.m. Um, Sundays through Thursday, um, now of course uh, via live stream, um, with a lay-led service that has been under the auspice of our men's club. Um, and so my uh, colleague Joel Busen, uh, president of the men's club, uh, reached out to me a couple of weeks ago, um, just uh, that date, October 1st, coming up, and so I sent him a few little snippets of what I could find on short notice. Um, the announcement of the daily service uh, from the bulletin, uh, September of 1945, um, and then mentioned in the annual report of the congregation um, how well it had been going. Um, so I hope everyone will, will see the sunset service um, this coming uh, week, um, celebrating the anniversary. And um, I think uh, my colleague um, will help me with some questions right now. Just bear with me. Erica, can you, thanks. 
Okay. Um, so lots of people are asking, uh, okay, if they can watch in the future. Um, I'm not sure if they mean this or um, the little clip I, I saw, but um, this lecture uh, is being recorded. Um, and then of course, um, the clip from the Jubilee um, will also be uh, available at a later date. Okay, so do you have any thoughts, or Wendy asked, um, do you have any thoughts as to why in the board records you shared in connection with the concert, uh, they were voted unanimously in favor of abolishing the Hofstra Rod thereafter. Well, wow, so, so Wendy really saw that with a very keen eye. Uh, this was again in the um, 1870 minutes. Um, I, I'm not sure I can go into that in depth right now, but, um, but certainly um, they were thinking about a lot of things. I mean, those minutes are very interesting. Um, while the outside of the building at 43rd Street had been completed, of course, by um, two years by then, they were still tweaking things on the inside. There's lots of discussion about acoustics and the organ and lighting, um, but I'd have to do a little bit more research about why they voted unanimously um, to eliminate the Hofstra Rock. Um, okay, so a question from Fred Roden. Uh, do we have transcripts of lectures from 1945? It would be interesting to know what Saul Baron had to say about the Jewish community of tomorrow. Um, that's a great question, Fred. Um, I can check, but I I'm not 100% sure um, that we have those. I, again, I think the 125th, we do have copies of those. They were printed in a book, um, but I don't think we have uh, transcripts, but I, I can double check on that. That's a great question. Uh, I'm just going to scroll up to see if there's anything else. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Betty Jane. Okay, so a question from Paul. Uh, when was the current synagogue built and who were the architects? How many synagogue buildings preceded the present one? Uh, great question, Paul. Um, so we are in the fifth home of the congregation. Um, however, that doesn't include Beth L's building. Um, so this building that, that I'm in right now or, or on 65th Street uh, was completed at the end of 1929, dedicated in 1930. Um, and the architects were, um, three Jewish architects, um, Cohn, Butler, and Stein was their, were their names. Um, and um, the other buildings were located on Clinton and Grand Street on the Lower East Side, on Christie Street, also on the Lower East Side, uh, East 12th Street between Broadway and 4th Avenue, I think, uh, and of course, 43rd Street. Um, Beth L, who was the congregation we merged with, their building um, was on 76th Street and 5th Avenue, and then prior to that, 63rd and Lex. Um, okay, great. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, I, I'm really so grateful um, for you to join me. Oh, I see one in the Q&A. Uh, okay, so a question from Patricia Rosenfeld. How about material from fathers, sons, and daughters' dinners in the 1950s and 60s? I have a picture and silver dollars. Uh, that's wonderful. Yes, we actually have lots of photographs um, from these father-son and father-daughter dinners. Um, some of them were organized by the men's club. Um, and I've shared a few on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram, um, to the invitations and the pictures of the dinners themselves too. So we do have material from that. Um, we'll, I'll try to share more as well. Um, okay, so I just wanna thank you so much. Um, I, uh, oh, a question from Rabbi Sepadin. Uh, what happened to the 43rd Street building? Great question. So in order to build the wonderful building that we're in today, um, we also needed some money. So they had to sell that building. Um, and, and with that money, uh, they were able to build this building. Um, so it was sold to a developer and that developer uh, knocked it down and it is now the left court national building. It's an office building. Um, and that's what happened to it. It's, it's really a shame, but we have wonderful photographs of it. Um, Let's see, so we have a question from uh, Lana Weiss. Uh, how do we get to visit the archives and others? Well, fortunately right now uh, we're close to the public, uh, but again, you can always email me, uh, wkline at emmanuelnyc.org, um, or give me a call, uh, the main temple line, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And you know, when the time is safe, uh, you can certainly make an appointment to visit the archives. Um, let's see, how do we get a piece of the building in the museum? Um, 
Ah, great question by, by my colleague, Jackie. Uh, behind me is uh, this large wooden element, architectural element um, from our 43rd Street building. And that um, is a really interesting story. Well, many objects uh, were taken with us and even stained glass windows, the, the main window uh, in the Bethel Chapel is from that building. Um, you know, this was an architectural detail that was above the bima that normally would have been demolished. Uh, but my predecessor, uh, Riva Godlove Kirschberg, um, received a call in 1986 that um, someone at a consignment store, I believe in Connecticut, um, had a piece of our old building. And so she went up there or received photographs. And um, sure enough, it was very clear with photographs we had in our archive that this was part of our building. We don't know why it was saved or how it was saved. I like to think it was maybe a construction worker or someone walking by who just thought it was beautiful. Um, but it's really this accidental piece of history that we were able to clean up um, and share um, in our museum. Um, okay, great. I'm gonna just um, stop the slideshow for a second and I'm gonna share one more thing, a message from Rabbi Davidson. So please just bear with me. And thank you guys so much. Uh, again, a Shana Tova to everyone. Thank you, Warren. Gamar Hatima Tova, everyone. We look forward to our continued worship together this afternoon. Okay, thank you all so much, Shana Tova.